beans. My loneliness. Sure. Let me make my spiel about beans. <clears throat> beans are kind of a simple. I'm going to pass these around too. Kind of a simple crop. Most everybody who gardens grows beans. I grow mostly pole beans because they yield so much more. But one point I wanted to make. I grew up eating canned Blue Lake beans, Ooh. which have these wonderful white seeds. And then, soon after I got interested in heirloom gardening, I, I got a hold of the folks in Landis Valley, and they have quite a, a neat bean collection. And what I found out is, most beans are, in fact, not white. Yeah. <laughs> these are Amish nettle beans, also known as Mayflower beans. These are Mostel or Mild Goose beans, so they're half white, but then they have orange with spots on them. This is Cherokee Trail of Tears beans, which is, all of these come from green beans that you can eat either as snap beans or you can use the seed as dry beans. These beans were carried by the Cherokee Indians when they were, went through the, what did they call it, the March of Death? Trail of Tears. Trail of Tears. Oh, I guess I knew that one too. The Trail of Tears. Well, they did the Trail of Tears. Uh, and they carried them with them. And, and so these are those same beans, same variety. Um, what I like about most of the heirlooms is you can use them for either snap beans or you can dry them and use them during the winter. Uh, that's not really that good if you try it with, I've been told, the blue lake beans, if you try it, they're, they're okay, but they're, they're not that great. Boring. boring. <laughs> As dry beans. Yeah, boring. I find them boring. I'll pass these around in case someone wants to look at them, just to get an idea of the differences in, in the seeds. A lot of these beans are available mail order now. Fifteen years ago, that wasn't the case. Uh, a really nice bean there is, well, I guess I could... How to write soup bean, another German-based bean. If you grow those, they're a bush bean. They're a few, one of the few bush varieties that I'll bother with. But what's nice about them is when you make soup out of them, it just kind of makes its own broth. It just kind of gets all thick and creamy all on its own. You don't have to do much to, to get one of those cream, cream type soups. So they're well worth growing it. Uh, Amish nuttle. Nuttle is uh, Pennsylvania Dutch for an animal dropping. A reference to animal dropping. Uh, typically, I find that they work good growing up my corn. Uh, every year I try to grow more things out of room for it than I, I, I always want to grow more beans and so I would have things go out of my corn and the Amish nuttle tends to do pretty good. Some of the others not so good, but Amish nuttle seems to be quite a poem on the uh, Mostella wild goose bean. Has anybody heard of that one before? So the story behind that one is, and every place that I've talked to anybody who's written about or anything has said the story in quotes because they don't know if it's true or not, is in, in was it Somerset County, Pennsylvania, <coughs> Uh, some, some farmer was out and shot a goose, brought it home, and when they were cleaning it, they found some beans in its craw, and the wife planted them the next year, and these are the descendants of those beans. <laughs> so, and, I, and I used to think that that was a absolutely positively had to be a true story, because who could make a story like that up? But now, as, I, as I've looked into the heirloom gardening world and found more beans, I, there's uh, uh, turkey craw beans, and, and you know, there, there's got to be four or five other references to beans that somebody found when they when they prepared an animal to eat, so I'm not sure it's true anymore. And we already talked about Cherokee Trail of Tears. Carrots. Okay, yeah. Carrots. Not especially popular with Pennsylvania Dutch, is, is what I've seen. Uh, used mostly as a flavoring, as an herb for flavoring. Uh, I don't know how many people here know this, but orange carrots are relatively new developments. Original carrots were white. Um, Dutch did it. Mm. The Dutch, right? The Dutch were the ones that refined the carrot to make them good today, or make them what they are today. Uh, Belgian white carrots you can still get. You can buy purple carrots now, which uh, originated from wild carrots in Afghanistan. Danvers is a name most people have heard of. Early scarlet corn. Anybody knows where you get early scarlet horn seeds? I would love to get early scarlet horn carrot seeds. I've had a hard time finding them. They're this carrot over here. It's a bit blunt, but they're referred to as the oldest cultivated carrot. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the size of carrot that I got. Um, I got some Renee seeds on their mixed carrots. Uh -huh. And when I let that grow, it came up yeah. about this big of it. It's probably an ox heart. 
Okay. Probably yeah. not Okay. Yeah. The, 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 these were supposedly extinct at one time. Now I see they're selling them in England, but I haven't found anybody over here that's selling them. Okay. And I don't know about the rest of you, but carrots and I don't get along. I, I uh, rarely get these not grow. I love them. Uh, either, either they don't come up, or they do come up 16 here, and then nothing for the next three feet, and then 30 there, and nothing for the next three feet. I tried mixing the seeds with sand so I can disperse them. Uh, I tried thinning them, and I just don't have the patience for that. So I'll try again this year because I do every year. <laughs> lettuce. Now lettuce. I like growing lettuce. There's so many types of lettuce out there. And each one of these is a German variety or a Pennsylvania Dutch variety. The story behind Forellenschluss, which, which is really kind of funny to me, is I had a neighbor who was growing his grandfather's seed. And, and so he and I were talking one day, and after he had stolen all my sweet corn, I said, well, then, Tom, you've got to give me some of that lettuce seed. <laughs> so he did, and I grew up for several years, and then uh, I joined this group called Seed Savers Exchange, and I was going through the catalog one year, and they had this lettuce there that, sure enough, was, without a doubt, the one that, that Tom had been growing. And so his father had brought that over from Germany, or not his father, his his ancestors had brought over from Germany many, many years ago, and it had been in their family all these years, but it is in fact Ferellen's juice, which I think means flashy trout backs, or yeah. something like that. Ferellen is trout. Okay. <clears throat> then there's Amish deer tongue, which is really not a very fancy lettuce, and it looks a little bit like a tongue, uh, but we have found that it holds up really, really well to the heat. So, so we like that one uh, a lot particularly for our later salads. And then Mesher Bib is one that I got from um, Landis Valley. It's, uh, I'm kind of partial to, first off, I'm partial to leaf lettuces. Uh, they seem to have much more taste than icebergs. Although I've been told if you get the true original iceberg lettuce and grow that, you find out that that has pretty good taste too. It's just the modern varieties that are watery and crunchy. Uh, but I'm partial to the ones that are multicolored, and there's a lot of heirlooms out there that are multicolored. These just happen to be three of the German ones. The Forel is just that it's, it's like maroon and green? Yes. Yeah, okay, it's hard to see. Yes. yes, 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 I'm sorry. And actually this one, too, is also maroon and green. The difference is this is all spotted. Yeah. And this one has patches of maroon with, with, with green. And they actually make really nice uh, really nice mixes if you mix them all up in a salad. They look really mm -hmm. nice. And then the other thing we do, it's not Pennsylvania Dutch, so it's not in here, but we have some red mustard. Uh, that's very spicy and pungent, and we use that into that too. But I, I left that out of here because it's not, not Pennsylvania Dutch. So. Okay, other greens at the Pennsylvania Dutch grew. Uh, I've, I've had some luck with corn salad. It's interesting, and I'll grow it because it's traditionally ripe, but it's not any better than any of the lettuces. Or atch, I've not tried. Um, Corn salad is supposedly naturalized in many areas where Pennsylvania Dutch live, but I have not seen any up around Sladenton naturalized anywhere. Yes? I did a thing with corn salad a few years ago because it likes the cold weather in the spring yes. and fall. So I would plant it in the, in the spring, leave a few plants to go to seed. They go to seed and drop down, and I plant my main crop, tomatoes, whatever it is in the middle of the year. By the fall, then those seeds sprout, and they grow in the fall. You can harvest them fall, winter, and spring, and then let a few go to seed, and the seeds stay dormant until cool weather comes in the fall. So they're like the off-season crop. So you got wow. and you got a perpetual. I, you can dig through the snow and eat these guys. Okay. Under the snow, wow. and they're so cold hardy. So they're very green in the middle of the winter. So I'm going to try that again because one of the problems I have is they did get bitter pretty quickly. <laughs> Mine did. Is that the same thing as mosh? Yes. Yes. Oh. Mosh, corn salad, brown lettuce. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yes. Now the orange, uh, we do grow that, and it's a little tough to get started. But that's a wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. It is. It really is, and it's now the same thing as the lady just said. Uh, we let it go to seed. And it self seeds beautifully, and you know, all you have to do is let it develop a little bit, then you can transplant it wherever you want. But trying to get it started, very tough, because like, it's like carrots, it's almost impossible to get it <laughs> But it, it self seeds itself beautifully. Now ours is all, it's, it's all three quarters of an inch to an inch high, where it's self seeded over the last fall. That's basically the warm weather, doesn't it, Borak? It doesn't hold as much as 
Uh, as a spinach wood. Yeah. Oh. Does that say that it grows six feet tall? Three to six feet. Yes, it does. That's Holy amazing. moly. That's <laughs> it's a lot. Oh, yeah, that's the stuff that so now I'm gonna have to try it again. Yeah. <laughs> and it's worth it. To, it's worth it. It's good eating. It's worth it. To oh, it's grow. excellent. Okay. It's a. I mean, it, it precedes spinach, mm -hmm. and it's uh, for our taste, it's uh, it's good. It's very good spinach. Okay. Excellent. Very cool. Okay. Peas. One of my favorites. Oh yes. Heka. Twiggy branches were used to support the vines. First year I did that, my neighbor came up to the house and said, what are you doing in your garden? I said, I find a peas. She goes, what are all those sticks for? I said, Joanne, for the peas to grow up. She goes, it doesn't look good. Put a fence up. No, Joanne, we're going to use the sticks. So I use sticks every year for, for, my, for my English peas. Uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch grew primarily soup and snow peas, is what I've heard, traditionally planted on St. Gertrude Day. This is one of the things I like to point out to people. If you go back 15 years, maybe now, 20 years, there was a snap pea developed, and that, that made it, it was, you know, big news. An All-American Garden Award winner for this new variety of pea, that you could grow the pea, and then you could harvest it, you keep the shell and the pea together, because the shell taste, tasted, uh, uh, tasted good, didn't get, didn't get tough. And uh, many, many references in literature about the Amish growing snap peas over 100 years ago. And in fact, now from seed savers, you can get uh, Amish snap pea, which is they got from some somebody in Lancaster, and they brought out the seed now, and that's actually one of the ones we grow in our garden. And they're real good. Um, <clears throat> Rice or sickle pod is available through Landis Valley. If you look, if you're interested, it's a snow pea. So you're going to pick that, use it for stir fries or maybe in, in salads when it's young. My favorite, blue pod cappuccinos. Anybody familiar with that one? It's, uh, it's my, well that's the picture of it there. So we're going to tell right away, we're looking at the flower that is different. Uh, the pods are blue, purplish blue. Uh, the peas can be eaten either as a, uh, a sugar pea or they can be used as a soup pea. You can't shell them out and eat them like an English pea. They're not like little green peas. They're, they're, they're terrible like that. But they're not one of these things where if you make soup out of them, they, they just disintegrate and make this really wonderfully creamy soup. It's brown, so, so you might not like the color of it, but it really, really tastes good. And that is by far my, my favorite pea. So. And it doesn't hurt that it looks so great. They get prime filling when you know, whichever square they're in, they're going to be on the side facing the house. Mm -hmm. So we can see those flowers. Mm -hmm. and, and you said put the whole pod and everything in to cook it? No, when you cook them, you shell them. Okay. You do shell them out, but you can't, you can't shell them and, 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 and boil them and eat them as peas. Okay. You've got to make soup out of them. Gotcha. Apparently, it's a big deal uh, in the Netherlands and northern Germany. The cappuccinos, right? The cappuccinos. Yes, yes, yes. And I love those things, so worth looking for. And on Amish snap, that's over 100 years old, is that the one? Yes, yes. You can get it from Seed Savers Exchange. <clears throat> favorite tomatoes. Everybody has favorite tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Okay, these happen to be the ones that I like to grow for what they're worth. Uh, Amish paste has got to be on the list. Uh, it's a great paste tomato. I'm not the only one that uses it for everything. I found that out today. We use it for everything. We, we kind of aren't into the big, big uh, beefsteak tomatoes. They're, they're juicy. I guess they're nice. They're not the ones we happen to like. We'll use Amish paste in salads, on hamburgers, to make spaghetti sauce. We use them for everything. And you can't really get a good picture of it. You see it real good there. But it, it looks like a typical paste tomato, except it's bigger. It's a lot bigger. Uh, brandy wine is the famous one. The one that made heirloom gardening famous for, for its taste. Um, my experience has been they don't yield that well. They yeah, taste great, but boy, yeah. you don't get a lot of tomatoes from them. And they, don't, and they don't taste that much better than the Amish paste that I'm going to devote a lot of my garden to. Them. So. My absolute favorite tomato, though, is the Howard German tomato. And I, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's an oblong tomato. It looks more like a, more like a pepper. 
If you stand and cover the, sh the sun there, maybe they can see it back up toward the window. Does that help? Oh, yeah. Okay. Those tomatoes, uh, those look real nice in that picture, but that's a, a selected group of, of them because <laughs> they, they tend to have green shoulders and they might crack a little bit more often than I would like to admit. But the thing is, they have such a small seed pocket and they're so dry that it's easy to make sauce out of them and they taste really good. And so we use them for everything too. The truth is I'll grow probably six or seven types of tomatoes a year, but most of them are going to be Amish paste and now we're German. Reason True was another one I like. It's, uh, it's a cherry tomato. My wife thinks they have tough skins. And I'm tired of hearing about the tough skins, so I don't grow them as often as I used to anymore. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other tomato choices. Rose is a, a pink beef steak. I think it tastes as good as brandy wine, and it tends to bear a lot more than brandy wine. It's also out of Lancaster uh, from the Mennonite community, so my wife likes that, being Mennonite herself. <laughs> Black brandy wine, brown shoulders. I know I have family members that think that's the coolest tomato. I'm just not into the black tomatoes or brown tomatoes. I like red tomatoes. Uh, Tiffin Mennonite's another nice one. It's, it's uh, one pound, but it can be a little rough. And then German strawberry looks like a strawberry. Again, I'm just giving you examples of heirloom German vegetables. There's obviously tons of Italian heirlooms out there and tons of French ones out there too. We grow all the Germans because of the heritage. My favorite things. Man, I love squash. I love winter squash. Uh, and there's some great ones that are connected to the Pennsylvania Dutch. First one is Amish pie. Has anybody ever had Amish pie? Squash? It's big. It's nice and big. It's, you can see there too, it's really thick. The flesh is really thick, so it's, it's not like some of these squash where you, by the time you take out the seed cavity, you got a layer that thick of meat that you're going to eat, but it's, it's a lot thicker. Uh, it's not overly sweet, so we can use it for a meal, but we can also use it to make pies out of it. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania Dutch cooked neck squash. It's got to be the easiest one. Uh, I, I just, you know, that neck, that entire neck is edible without seeds. So, so it's just wonderful on a grill to just cut the neck in slices and grill it and it gets all nice and sweet. Uh, very easy to make pies out of that one too. Blue Hubbard is not necessarily connected to the Pennsylvania Dutch in any way, but I love them, so it's on here. <laughs> <laughs> My issue with them, those of you who are gardeners, if you can help me, is the vines, the, the squash vine borers seem to target those worse every year. They, they really don't bother the Pennsylvania Dutch crookneck squash at all, but my hubbards just get decimated every year. I just can't. What's going on? Uh, squash vine borers. Mm. They, they, it's a, a moth and it, it lays eggs inside the, uh, the stem right near the ground where it comes out. Mm. And I, I've tried everything. I've tried putting dirt over the stems when they run so that they would root someplace else. I've tried cutting them out. I just can't. Supposedly, if you be careful, you can cut them out, remove them, and, and the plant will live. Oh. Yeah, I think that works for me like one out of five times. So, um, so if anybody has any ideas, let me know. Less common heirloom garden plants. Jerusalem artichokes. You growing Jerusalem artichokes? Anybody else growing Jerusalem artichokes? I want to. If you want a carefree vegetable to grow, that's it. That's one. But care, carefree also means keep an eye on it because it will take over everything. And unfortunately, they look real pretty. I don't know if you can see the picture there, but they're sunflower-like flowers late in the season, uh, and uh, they're good. So you eat the it's the roots, right? The yeah. Root. Okay. This over here is the is the tuber. Mm -hmm. So you dig it up out of the ground. When do you do that? It's after the plants. Anytime. Are oh, anytime. Okay. Except, uh, not so much in the spring when they start to shoot up, they're all mushy and gross, but yeah. other than that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Parsnips. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Man, I love parsnips. Oh, too. And I don't know many people that eat parsnips anymore. You yeah. do? You do? Yeah. Our kids will eat them. Hey, they're great. They get real sweet. If you, if you cook them right, they get real sweet. Very sweet. Carolyn makes a, a, it's by far my favorite soup, is, is sweet potatoes and parsnips. She, 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 she. she uh, cooks them so they get sweet, both of them, and then she throws them all in a blender and 
Runs them up and they this real smooth soup is just excellent. She puts other stuff in there too, but I don't know what it is. I just eat it. But I love parsnips. Another one though that I have a, a very difficult time trying to get to to sprout parsnips. Well, the parsnip seed is only viable for about a year. After a year, the germination rate goes down. You get low fifty percent, and the seeds themselves can take three weeks to germinate, like mm -hmm. parsley. And by that time, there's so many weeds coming up around them, I can't find them. Uh, try planting some radish seeds in with them, like every the five inches. Okay. Mm -hmm. Watch a row for you. Okay, that's a good idea. I will try again with the parsnips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You did pretty good luck last year. We did the I mean, short rows, but we were just trying things out. But that's true. They, great. they actually came in good, and we had some nice, good sized ones that weren't too woody. So. Yeah. I love parsnips. After frosting, they look sweeter. Yeah. Yes, they yeah. Will. But brown, uh, just, just even brown on a grill, they think it's too much. Get hungry. <laughs> <laughs> ground cherries. Anybody grow ground cherries? All right. How do you get rid of the dirt? How do you lose for like 26 years? They're not that bad. They I've not had that problem. They grow wild at my house everywhere. Yeah. Oh my God. I tried transplanting plants of them and the plants would die. I took a, a handful of ground, ripe ground cherries, yeah. threw them on the ground in the fall, and had a bunch in the spring. Yeah. Which yeah. makes me they wonder. And you can't yeah. pull them up. They're connected directly to the center of the earth. <laughs> Which makes me wonder. Because I've had the same problem, but, but once they get going, they do tend to volunteer, which yeah. I happen to like. Yeah. There's, there's two varieties. Oh, yeah. Yes? One is a weed and one is a ground cherry. Yeah. That's true. Oh. And the weed is the one that's so noxious. Yeah. You have to go out to, uh, what he was talking about, the Goshen Hoppins. Mm -hmm. yeah. They'll tell you the difference. There's very little difference between the two of them. Well, what I've seen, and maybe this is just because local, but, but the the ground cherries tend to get quite, quite a big bush. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the yeah. wild ones, Stay Not small. so big around Stay here. Small. So, so I can't tell early, but by August I can tell which the weeds are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, they, they, these things literally take over entire sections of the garden, and they're huge. Wow. <laughs> but are they good? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I like them, but nobody else seems good. Are they? It's a sweet pineapple flavor. Is it, is it like their tart? It's more like a if you go if you go to a restaurant there's a lot of restaurants a lot of fancy restaurants that will give you uh, ground cherries as a garnish on whatever it is they're serving for dessert oh, okay and they make great pie you're right really yes ground cherry pie okay keep an eye out for that apple butter and all that yeah yeah so the, the fruit is green then still, like the uh, it turns yellow. It turns yellow. It's yellow. It does yellow. Okay. Now, what we do is we, we don't pick them. We wait till they drop. Yeah. And then we pick them up. Okay. Yeah. They're still green on the plant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. But they're excellent too. I love them. No, no, they turn yellow as well. Potatoes. I got to tell you, I grew up on potatoes. We have potatoes for breakfast every day. And I, I love it. I gotta have my potatoes. They were a field crop. Uh, women cut the pieces of the plant. The guys planted them. I'm not. That's not a comment on social structure. I'm just telling you the way they used to do it. <laughs> In my house, I cut the pieces and I plant them. <laughs> uh, the varieties that that I could find proof that Pennsylvania Dutch grew were Blue Peerless which I can't find any place anymore. I can't even find the inter many internet references except the two that I found said it's probably extinct. Uh, there is a peerless potato out there, but it's not blue peerless. And then early rose, which is still available. Oh, it used to be called Ronegers. I forget what it's called now, but you can get early rose mail order out of Idaho. Mm -hmm. And then they used to grow different types of fingerlings. How many people grow fingerling potatoes? I like fingerlings. <laughs> They're very versatile too. Corn. Welsh corn. This was an interesting comment I found in one book. One book. It was many Pennsylvania Dutch called corn Welsh corn. 
And in Germany, according to this book, in Germany, strange things were always referred to as Welsh. <laughs> you know? Corn, corn means any grain. Yeah, any, any, grain. any grain. There was there's wheat corn and rye corn and oat corn and Welsh corn. So yeah. corn is the main word for grain. It's only in America yeah. that we call corn corn. Yeah. They call it maize. Maize, maize, maize right. Yeah. And I think everybody knows sweet corn was, was, you know, discovered by the American Indians, North and South American, not just North American. I, I want a source that says white settlers first noticed corn in the mid-1700s in Pennsylvania, which conflicts with my memory from being a school kid, where I, I learned that the folk came off the Mayflower and ate corn yeah, that, that first winter in Massachusetts. <laughs> I, I need to go back and figure out which book that was. The Susquehannocks were from corn. Yeah, we documented in the 1600s. Yeah. So, so I, I need to figure out which, I wish I could put a footnote by it so I could remember yeah. the source that was. Well, the Three Sisters, though, yeah. wasn't that the was Southwest. Just, that's all, only the Southwest then? Well, or the Iroquois. The Iroquois, the Iroquois did yeah. too, but I guess the Southwest is, is the one that gets they most call of the credit the, because the Three Sisters. Yeah. Your, your Moravians were working corn with Lowland is who they were very close to in the early 1700s. Okay. So it was, it was clearly, uh, clearly had been, yeah. and they were you know, almost crop that they, they got from the Indians in, in the Bethlehem Nazareth area. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of diary accounts of that in the 1730s, 1740s. Corn, I guess everybody knows too, if you're going to grow it yourself, you got to plant it in blocks. Unless you have a huge field, make sure it gets pollinated. Um, no fish. No reference to Pennsylvania Dutch putting fish underneath the corn. <laughs> yes. They yeah. eat their fish. Yes, yeah. yes, really. They have a comment on the GMOs. Yes. Corn. Yeah, I. Can we still get the original seeding, or is it all GMO now? Even Bernie's has not GMO corn seed. Yeah, it's but I think, I think the question that's being asked is is how sure are we that it's not GMO? You, you can isolate it, but because the pollen oh, goes yeah. so far, you, 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 there, you, it's quite possible that, that <clears throat> there's some cross-pollination. So I guess it depends on where you get your seed from mm -hmm. and, how, and how isolated they are. What do you recommend to study that you can recommend when you get it to make sure it's not GMO? A lot of the catalogs will say on the front whether they have, or they'll mark them GMO, non-GMO, and they'll say we don't sell any. Yeah, but there's, I, I think the discussions around it is it intentionally GMO right. or unintentionally oh, yeah. GMO, and I, yeah. I don't. You know, yeah. you know, I would if I was going to bed, I would. I would go to one of the, the heirloom seed sources. I would go to Seed Savers. I would go to Baker Creek, the big operations that are that are that are running these heirlooms because they. Uh, they grow their own seed, so, so the odds are good that there's not... Number one, they grow their own seed. Number two, because they're trying to make sure that, they, that they're genetically true. They're covering uh, the plant, the, the, the corn, the ear, to make sure it doesn't get crossed with anything else. So my guess is they're probably the safest bet in those places. Pennsylvania Dutch use a lot of aged manure on their crops, too. And uh, they didn't compost it. And every time I have this discussion, somebody points out to me, well, then you're going to get weeds. You've got to compost it to get weeds. And I'm sure that's true, but I don't have a big problem. I've not been composting mine either. You yet. don't get weeds from a ruminant like a sheep or yes. a cow. You don't get weeds from there. Okay. But horses, on the other hand, horses, yeah. Yeah. They don't horses have anything. weeds. But I'm not, I'm not <laughs> having a big weed problem. You're not? Now, what I do is you're I will not take. I understand. But, but uh, mine will sit for a year before I put it in the garden. So I'm not oh, composting yeah. it and watching the temperatures. You're aging it. But I am aging it, yeah. Oh, that's germinated Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that might be it. No, no. there's got to be cabbage, right? Yes? In the manure pile, before composting and everything and aging, my mother said, when you're the bigger the manure pile, the more the animals you own, 
the richer you are. <laughs> they piled it all up in the winter, and then they hauled it to show their wealth. Uh, that was the Wonderful. So, so I have a pile of horse manure that I piled up all winter, so maybe well, I should put yeah, that down and up on the road. Uh, I'm sure I get some comments, but probably not. <laughs> I could see that. That actually, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I they pile it out to the barnyard. The bigger the pile, the wealthier you are. Yeah. Yes. Wealthy and more than just one. What was that? Oh, there's pictures of the corn. Oh, yeah. Okay, so every every corn here. I don't know if you can see it, but every corn that's up here, I have actually grown at one time or another. Uh, the black Mexican is by far my favorite. Um, it, it is white when it's in the milk stage. So if you catch it in the milk stage, it is very good. And, and I'm not one that likes really, really, really sweet, sweet corn. I prefer that it be corn that has some sweetness to it. And I, and I really like the black Mexican. Uh, the, the, in fact, I'll tell you this too. My sister, who went to New Jersey, I would always have this, uh, in the fall, have this uh, family picnic at my place. And she would always bring the Jersey corn because the Jersey corn is so good. And, and so when she brought her corn, she set it down on our back patio. And she says, there's the corn. I'll husk it later. And she went in to talk to my mom. So I took her corn. I took it down the field. I filled her bag with my black Mexican. And I put it back there. So she comes up. She starts peeling. She's like, oh! What's wrong with the corn? <laughs> this hasn't happened before. <laughs> another one that we grow is Bloody Butcher. It's another, and maybe this is true for all corns. Again, in the milk stage, it's pretty good eaten as a sweet corn. Uh, Bloody Butcher, we grind and make flour out of too, though. So. Country Gentleman, everybody's had that, right? That's really popular around here. At least it was when I was a kid. Shoe pet corn, no no rows, just the kernels all over the place. That's a pretty good one too. Stowell's Evergreen. Uh, I think that's the one that some guy developed, and a friend asked if he could have some seed because he liked the corn so much. And the guy goes, "Yes, but you can't sell it to anybody. You know, in a couple of years when I have more seed, I'm going to go sell it to somebody, and they're going to distribute it." And the guy he gave the seed to went out and sold it right away, and made a lot of money on it. <laughs> So I wasn't a very good friend. Uh, for for uh, if you're lazy like I am and you try to save your own seed and you don't want to be tying cobs of corn off and then hand pollinating to make sure that that it's purebred, what what I tend to do, in fact, the three of them up there between black Mexicans, Stowalls, Evergreen, and Bloody Butcher, I can grow three different types of corn that mature different enough times that that I can I can save my seed. Now, I buy new seeds every couple of years anyway because there's other people growing corn around me, so I'm pretty sure I'm getting a little bit of cross pollination. And then cabbage, obligatory, right? If you're Pennsylvania Dutch, you got to grow cabbage. You know? uh, known as grout for leaf. Uh, flowers the second year, so if people save your own seed, you, you grow the cabbage. Then, then typically you'll bring it indoors, put it in a root cell, and bring it back out. Then the following year, plant it again, you know, bring it in with the other roots, with the roots, and then uh, it'll flower, and you get the seed that way. Okay. So early Jersey, early, early Jersey Wakefield. That's what it should be. Early Jersey Wakefield. That's a huge cabbage, by the way. Resources. The fun in this for me is not this. The fun in this for me is going to all these places where I can learn more things than I can pick up a new one today. So I'll see you in August. <laughs> <laughs> Burnside Plantation in Bethlehem. Up oh, 36 beds. I said 20 some early. 36 beds. It's terraced on its hillside. It's very nice. They gave me, uh, um, I was there helping them out once. I took a group of people from work to do some volunteer work there. And they were growing these irises that had some sort of, again, some sort of religious significance in the Pennsylvania Dutch community. The lady who was there didn't know what it was, but she said, here, take some of these home anyway. So if anybody knows why these white or light blue irises have any significance, uh, uh, religious
religious significance in Pennsylvania Dutch, I'd love to know that too, because I have them go to my garden. Gladys Valley, my favorite place to go. My wife's tired of me taking her down there. <laughs> but there's so much history there, not just if you're a gardener. There's, there's all the old buildings, and, and it's, just, it's, just, it's just a great place to go, spend a day. Uh, there's, there's just a lot there. And it is the home of the Herbal Seed Project, and they do sell seeds there. And then I have a couple of texts in case you want to read up about it, about this stuff. Uh, let me see. This one here is a book called Pennsylvania German Farms, Gardens, and Seeds. So a little bit of everything we talked about today is in here along with a lot more. Um, I didn't realize this, but apparently the, we who was talking about this this morning. Pennsylvania Dutch used to grow saffron too, the crocuses at saffron. We grow the Fall blooming crocus. 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 Fall blooming they have interviews with, with folks talking about what they planted, when they planted, varieties they planted, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of information in here. Uh, I don't have it with me. wouldn't matter anyway. My favorite source, Moon, Rue, and Mary's Roots, Plants of the Pennsylvania Dutch Four Square Garden. That came out of the Renfrew Institute for Cultural and Environmental Studies in Waynesville. It's just, it's a very dry thing, unless you're interested in the topic and you're looking for data on what was grown by who and when. It's very dry, it's not a good read, but it's in a CD. It's excellent. We already talked about Landis Valley. Uh, seeds, I highly recommend Seed Savers Exchange. Let me explain Seed Savers Exchange. Has anybody worked with Seed Savers Exchange or heard of Seed Savers Exchange? <laughs> they do put out a catalog every year, okay? And they have selected heirloom varieties for sale in their catalog. If you join and become a member, you're eligible to have access to the other members, all of which are seed savers, and you can buy vegetable varieties that are not available in the catalog. Some of them are quite rare. And just so you know, this is the catalog for members. So this is, and there's nothing in here but lists of people with different seeds that you can swap. Okay. And someday after May 29th, when I'm retired, I'm actually going to go through here and see if there's anything I want, like Scarlet Horn Care. <laughs> if you're a member of Seed Savers Exchange, you also can get this uh, quarterly newsletter with information about what heirlooms they're growing. That's just, I think, a pretty good organization. Uh, Baker Creek also sells extensive, also has an extensive collection of heirlooms. In fact, they have more for sale than Seed Savers does. And then the last one there is Amish heirloom seeds. Has anybody heard of Amish heirloom seeds out of, out of Lancaster? Okay, so that was the first heirloom seed place I ever found. I actually don't use them anymore because I found some of their varieties to be misnamed uh, when I started looking at seed savers and, um, and Baker Creek and Landis Valley. You know, you get something that's clearly the same variety as what you bought from someplace else with a different name. So. I'm not sure that their research is going Anyway, that's it. Bravo. Questions? <laughs>